or something and you're like ah let me just check instagram real quick like actually i need a coffee first and then i'll do it so that self-interruption is because your brain wants a reward and it knows it can get it from coffee from your mobile phone so the best thing to do is to say okay actually i really need to write down whatever i need to write down so i'm going to check my phone in five minutes and what tends to happen is by the time it's been five minutes because the dopamine has been removed from it also the, the reward aspect has been removed you're most less likely to want to check your instagram anyway self-interruption is a big 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 thing right now it's one of the things i talk about a lot Thank you so much for tuning in to another Cool Down Conversations. Today's guest is Nicole Vignola, better known as Nicole Neuroscience. She's a neuroscientist, public speaker, and soon-to-be new author. We dive into her story. She gives us some golden nuggets on how we can change our lives for the better. And some funny stories about how we met. Let's get into it. I'm chilled. You know, it's so weird. Like, I don't really get nervous anymore. Like, I spoke in front of 600 Mm -hmm. people on Thursday, and I was like, okay, I haven't done this bigger group in a while. So I was a bit like, but ultimately like as soon as i get on stage i'm like nah this is fine (laughs) but i could feel myself like not sorry i was just gonna say like i can feel myself wanting to say oh i'm really nervous but then i like i'm like i just shut it off right there i'm like you're not don't even say that you're not nervous because as soon as you say that you're like a little snowball (laughs) into it so i'm just like no it's not happening today (laughs) well at what point did you realize that that was it like a correction you had to make and it was a choice that you that you could make that i mean it must have been like a point where say listen i'm not going to allow myself to say that i'm even nervous it's not worth the the anxiety probably i would say immediately like i remember walking past the sort of crowd because it was like a couple yeah. of speakers it wasn't 600 people all at the same time it was kind of like blocked up into different floors and I was like I could like I walked past and I saw how big the crowd was and I was a bit like I felt this like sense of anxiety and I felt myself wanting to say like oh I'm actually quite nervous and I was like no like I shut it off right there and then you know, I was <laughs> like I can't go down that route <laughs> Because, you know, like if you start repeating the things you say to yourself, you do then, you know, manifest into your behavior, into mm. the way you act and then, you know, kind of perpetuates and everything you do. So I'm a big believer in like not saying things that you don't really believe. Normally what I used to do on the cool down conversations, I do like my first intro spiel and then, but then I realized like once I would record them that you actually record that separately. So like, I don't need to introduce you now and say like, oh, Nicole is a neuroscientist and a, and a public speaker and all these like i don't need to do that anymore uh, i know it's great it's for always... me because it's like less kind of stiff you know and like interview yeah you can just kind of talk and get into it which is fun and um, for me because otherwise i'm like thank you thank you <laughs> and then i get into yeah, it like thank you very much hands, yeah. <laughs> it's like when someone sings yeah. you happy birthday and you're like do you know what i i had a birthday party this weekend it was my birthday a couple weeks ago but i don't, I don't normally celebrate my birthday yeah. But this year I thought it's a big one, like we got engaged, we moved, like it was a big thing. So I remember standing on the bar, because it was Coyote Ugly themed, and I literally went, <laughs> sing to me! Because I was like, I don't know what else to do, so I'm just going to egg them on and be like, sing! Yeah, yeah let's just <laughs> rip the band-aid off, get it over with. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. That's hilarious. So, Nicole, and do I say your last name right, Vignola? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, Vignola, Vignola. Is, yeah. Is Vignola... Is, Nikki Viggs, a nickname that you've ever had? Or does yes, that sound actually. terrible? Is it? <laughs> it sounds it sounds terrible. It, it sounds terrible, but it is a nickname that I've had. <laughs> oh my goodness. Because I was riffing the other day and I was like, yeah, Nikki Viggs sounds good. And I wasn't wasn't sure if I should even <laughs> put that out there to call you. <laughs> I love it. Call me whatever. <laughs> yeah, cool. Awesome. So for those that are listening in, me and Nicole met in Bristol. And do you remember how we met? Yeah, Kobe the dog yeah dog. kobe the dog which <laughs> listen if you we were always taught not to speak to strangers by the way like our whole life and i met some of the most amazing people by just chatting Talk them to up the strangers in a cafe or just talk to strangers right like and <laughs> it always makes the i don't know introduction easier when there's a dog there and yeah. you know nicole at the time had this beautiful puppy named kobe who was named after kobe Bryant, the late kobe Bryant. is that correct that is correct because he loves to play yeah. ball <laughs> <laughs> he loves to play ball and ever since then we we hit it off and we can dive a little bit more into you know that conversation but we would we went to this local cafe in bristol which i love which i know you're in portugal now i'm sure you miss because it was honestly the best cafe 
And I'm from New I York, had and to I'm have saying it. something like that. It was, it's probably the best that I've been to. I had to have an intervention because, uh, you know, looking at my bank statements every month, I was kind of like, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is kind of a problem. <laughs> but then I thought, you know, I don't, I'm a freelancer. I don't pay for an office. So I kind of see it as yeah. like my office space. <laughs> but I was eating oh, like every goodness. day. Yeah. I know. I, I, also was doing that and realizing like I had just finished playing football and didn't technically I was unemployed when I met you and then I started to look at my bank statements and I was like all right (laughs) let me just cut it down to an espresso a day and not the full brunch (laughs) (laughs) because you don't like you get the brunch and then you're there for an an extra hour then you're like oh I have the cake now as well (laughs) (laughs) yeah they loved us there for sure Um, yeah 100 percent. that's amazing so but it was it it was a great conversation because obviously we we first met and then there was a lot of alignment that we had in regards to coaching and and i was able to learn more about you but you know today's call is really about you your story and you know how you're helping people via neuroscience and neuroplasticity and all these major buzzwords that i'm going to throw out and probably butcher but (laughs) You know, I did want to dive into, you know, a little bit about your brief, a brief background of, of, you know, how you ended up in the chair today. Where did you come from? You know, what's a little bit about your story? Yeah, I don't even know where to start. So I guess, so yeah, obviously I studied neuroscience, loved it. But what yeah. I found was that the topics of conversation weren't really being made accessible to people. So I wanted to find a way to be able to digest this for the everyday person. So I went into organizational psychology so that I could work with companies, organizations, and actually help with pivotal shifts in businesses by helping people, by helping the companies, but then attaching science to it. Because, you know, I walk into organizations and I'll talk about you know, the things that we have been talking about for a long, long time, like, you know, meditation, sleep, etc. But as soon as I attach the science to it, you can literally see kind of like penny drop. I can see people are like, ah, okay, that makes so much more sense. And now people are willing to do it because it doesn't have to be, I feel like health and wellness is sometimes attached to like, people that that some people don't resonate with that so they'll say things like oh, I'm not a healthy and fit person so I don't do that I don't meditate because mm. that doesn't belong to me but actually these kind of practices belong to everyone so it's just making sure that we are making them accessible and kind of like taking the I don't even know if the stigma is the right word but just educating because once you have the knowledge on you know how to take care of yourself then you can better apply it to your life mm. now when you've I mean, obviously, you didn't just begin work. You didn't walk into a business and say, hey, listen, I want to make your team better. There must have been a lead up to that. And, and you know, if anybody that follows you realizes that you have quite the following on social media. But I remember meeting in that cafe one time and you were like, yeah, I kind of posted one time. And then one thing led to the next. Somebody else shared it. And then now here you are with a quarter million followers plus. What was that like and how did that start? Yeah, so that happened pretty quickly. I started posting regularly last January, my Instagram honestly blew up. Like I stopped getting notifications because it was just so crazy. I gained like sort of 285,000 followers in the space of two weeks, which is maybe around 260 because I already had around 30,000 at the time. So it all happened really quickly. And I did kind of, I don't know if you know Gary V, but I did kind of Gary V it. Someone asked me to do a talk and I was like, yeah, I do these things all the time. <laughs> like kind of like pretending like that was my job and I had never done one before. So I was just like, I'm just going to wing it. You know, I've now said that I'm going to do it. So I'm going to just do it. And it was pretty good. I mean, it was, it was, yeah, maybe not the best one, obviously, but I'm pretty proud of it. So I just kind of like, faked it till I made it in some respects when it came to public speaking. <laughs> Do you remember what the talk was on or did you, have you completely, did you black out during that? <laughs> that no, no, I remember it. It's stuff that I still talk about today. And I think that's one of the reasons why I found it kind of easier mm. in some ways to talk about because it wasn't like I was, you know, completely pulling it out of nowhere. It was stuff that I am mm. very passionate about. And it's basically like productivity, how we can, better our cells. I mean, there's so much that it was, to be honest, if anything, the talk was probably too condensed. I probably put in too much information into it. I wish that I kind of diluted it a little bit, but I was just so excited that I was like, oh my God, my first public speaking gig. Here we go. Sure. <laughs> sure. Now I remember, I, I think you're talking about that, that situation where Gary V was basically asked to speak and he had no 
groundwork for how to charge or what to even say. And yeah. He just started throwing out numbers, and the guy was like, "Yeah, sure, I'll pay for it." <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was yeah. that like for you when you when you're like, "All right, I, I I need to be paid for this service." You know, how did you find that <laughs> that that payment? Well, well, they they gave me a budget. It was nowhere near what Gary Vee got paid. <laughs> <laughs> But it was like, it was still a big number for me. I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. Like I can, I can work with this. You know, at the time she was like, the budget's really low, but, and I guess now that I've done speaking gigs, it is, it is very low. But for me, having never earned that much per hour, I was like, this is fantastic. So yeah, it was, it was great. It was nice to know that, do you know what it was? I had a real mental breakdown after I finished my degree because I was kind of like, I've wasted three years of my undergrad and two years of my master's just like wow on what but i'm never going to use this lol (laughs) yeah especially after neuroscience i had like a complete meltdown because i was like i've I've just wasted like my entire degree and i don't i don't know if i'm ever going to use this this is kind of like a waste of time and money which is pretty hilarious now thinking about it but uh, i know i know it's pretty crazy how the world works so i had like a little breakdown because i applied for a couple of jobs and i didn't want to work in research i didn't really know what to do and I knew that I wanted to work in business and, you know, sh- help, you know, what I do now is essentially. Mm. So when this opportunity came through, I was kind of like, this is pretty cool that I get to use my knowledge for something that's like completely different from what I thought I would be doing, which would have been research or working in a lab. And it's also like a pretty, I don't know what the word is, but it's like not niche, but it's entrepreneurial, I guess, mm. which it's something that I've always done. I've always been self-employed. I've never really worked for anyone. And you can argue that has its cons. I'm sure it does. But it, it was pretty cool knowing that I could sort of take the lead in what I wanted to do with the degree and not be confined to the jobs that I wasn't getting, for example. Wow. So almost three years of work and you left feeling deflated, like this isn't like I wasted all my time. And then you know, fast forward a year, two years, and and here you are now where this is not only your passion, but your profession every single day. And the next point I want to make, which is leading to, you know, what we're excited about is this, the launch of your new book that's coming out. And I know that we can pre-order that too. So I'll definitely put those links into the bio, but can you talk on that? Because that, I mean, what a 180 from feeling (laughs) down and depressed to coming out with a book and and people (laughs) wanting to listen to you and and getting hired to speak and to help people what's that like yeah I guess I think what I what I tend to do well and what I've sort of the feedback that I get is that I make things tangible I make them accessible and I'm Mm. diluting sort of neuroscience concepts to the everyday life which is kind of like a space that hasn't really been explored that much. So the book, and I think the reason the Instagram did so well is because it was like explaining the science, but then helping you with tools and solutions to how you can apply this to your life. So all of a sudden people are like, okay, actually this is quite valuable because it's not only just information that's being thrown at me, it's like Mm -hmm. solution-based. And that's what the book is about. It, you know, talks about how we basically create these narratives for ourselves, either through our parents that have given us these narratives, you know, they kind of like put you in a box or, you know, circumstances, socioeconomic factors, whatever it is. So then we grow up with these narratives, these stories that we tell ourselves and we live within the confines of where we, what we're supposed to be and who we're supposed to be. But yeah. we can break out of those things. We can change them and essentially rewire it's called rewire ourselves to be anything that you want to. So any like bad sort of, coping mechanisms any any sort of unwanted behaviors and habits we we can change them and i think people don't realize that you can until Mm. you know i I still get it a lot like people are still flabbergasted that you can actually change these things i don't think people really put that much thought into it so yeah Mm. explaining the science has, has been really helpful in helping people you know make that change now what i mean i'm sure because of all the research that you're doing what's some common threads that you see in patterns that people get caught up in most or you know what's an area that that you think most people probably relate to when it comes to certain patterns that they've been that been stuck in for quite some time i think negative self talk is a big one and self limiting beliefs so not believing that someone is good enough to say do what they want to do I'm not mm-hmm. good enough to do a public speaking event because they've never done one you know and uh, yeah i think the negative self talk is one of the things that comes up the most from when I speak to people and when I work with people as well. Mm. 
Yeah. Now you, you shared a little bit on, you know, how you got past that and you just literally stopped it dead in its tracks and no, I'm not going to be nervous before I speak. Now for someone that maybe has been caught in this pattern for years, whether it's through a relationship trauma or, or whatever it is that leads us to that, how hard is it for us to break those traumas, to break that pattern? I mean, everybody's rewiring, I'm sure looks different. Yeah. I mean, that's a difficult question because, mm. it, you know, everybody's different. It depends on how deeply ingrained the trauma is. It, you know, there's obviously mm. so much to it. It's so multifaceted, but the good news is that you can change it. You can, you know, you know, I've had, I've had triggers and sort of behaviors that I've been working on for years. And sometimes I, you know, look back and I'm like, actually I've changed so much. So I, I kind of see it as like a process you know, I, th I think it's it's a really difficult question to try and answer, but everybody is completely different. So it depends. Yeah. I mean, it takes between 18 to 256 days to create a new habit. Mm -hmm. So that's a quite a big range because it depends on how deeply ingrained the habit is. It depends on how much intention and attention we put into this new habit. But, you know, we can also create new neurons instantly. So depending on the magnitude of the situation, so say, for example, you're walking down the street, you bump into your friend that you haven't seen in a while and you start chatting. A month later, you, I say, Pax, when did you bump into Sarah? And then you're like, I don't know, it was like a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember. But if you had to bump into Sarah and there was like, say, a really like traumatic car accident that happened at the same time, you would most likely be able to remember that event forever because you, wow. um, the magnitude of neurotransmitters that are responsible for plasticity have been heightened. So if mm. something is meaningful, is attached to trauma or is attached even to like an emotion, it doesn't have to be a traumatic event, it can be an emotional event. That means that our norepinephrine and acetylcholine, which are two of the neurotransmitters that are responsible for creating plasticity are higher. So there's more mm. plasticity involved. So we can create new pathways or memories pretty much instantly but we can also recreate new pathways within the space of three weeks so new you know ways of thinking for example so it's, it's a complicated question but yeah. the good news is that there is always ability for change yeah that and i mean you explain that quite well now plasticity is kind of becoming more of a word that we're seeing more often obviously if, if anybody follows you this is you know the root of basically everything that you do can you give us a definition of plasticity and, and what it is, what that means and how to create it and to, just yeah. to help for some of our listeners, especially, I mean, I, I'm saying for our listeners, but I'm also just like pointing to me you, yeah, for our listeners, <laughs> me as well. <laughs> no, so, okay. So plasticity, the word plastic means it's moldable to mm -hmm. be able to change. So it's actually why we call it plastic surgery, not because mm -hmm. we attribute it to Barbies. I think that's like the big misconception <laughs> when you hear plastic surgery, people think plastic as in wow. Barbie Guilty. dolls. Yeah. 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 No, but me as well. So no, plastic means moldable to be like changeable. So the brain is said to be plastic because it can change. So we can create new pathways. We can essentially reshape and remold our way of thinking. So, you know, you see it in like, for example, if you had to lose your sight or your ability to, to speak, other senses will take over and become reinforced and strengthened. So, you know, people who are blind, for example, have tactile discrimination to be able to read Braille. If you've ever put your finger over a Braille reading, you mm. you can't discriminate the difference. You're kind of like, what is going on? But someone that is blind would be able to discriminate because other senses have had to take over. So the brain likes to maximize its sort of cortical, let's call it like cortical rent or what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like lo lo location, like if there's a space available, the brain's going to take over and buy it. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, but where we can also reshape and reorganize pathways that are already there. You don't necessarily need to lose any senses for you to be able to do this. You can, you can reshape your way of thinking. So the difference between the adult brain and the child brain is that children can learn passively. So you could put on a French tape in the background of your child's life from the age of zero to eight, and they will most likely be able to pick up French. But wow. if you and I, I don't know if you speak French, but if you wanted to learn to speak French, I don't speak French, mm -hmm. you would have to actually, yeah, wee, wee. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like Joey from Friends when it comes to French. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope somebody gets that reference. I hope somebody oh, gets I it. Get it. And I can't wait. I'm already thinking about a social media post. 
to combine the two is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd have to actually pay attention to the words. You wouldn't be able to just put on the background and expect to learn it. You have to tell the brain this is important because when we're children, everything is important to the brain. We're absorbing everything like sponges. Mm. When we're adults, we have the ability to block out things that are not important. So, for example, you oh, looking at me. I don't know if there's any background noise on your end, but you could zone in to the sound of the birds outside whilst also listening to me, but you weren't paying attention to the birds until I've said it. You weren't paying mm. attention to the fact that I'm sitting on a sofa, there's a cushion, there's a curtain, until I've just said it because your brain has not attached any importance to that. I'm important right now. So if you want to learn about the curtain, for example, you have to say to your brain, okay, well, we need to learn about this now. And the same thing goes for the things that you want to learn. So if you want to say, okay, I want to create a new habit you have to tell the brain this is important this is what we need to pay attention to because if you don't mm. it's most likely going to get blended back into the background like the curtain like the cushion like the birds outside they become part mm. of your background we have a network of brain areas that essentially filters out senses that are not important they're still coming in your eyes are still bringing in billions of bits of information like the sofa mm. behind me the coffee table that i'm not looking at but i'm looking at you that information mm. is still coming in your brain is just filtering it out does that make sense now it makes so much sense and how much because our brain is still picking up on all these other sensory overloads that we have how much can our brain take in where we're not where we're getting full intention and full attention to these things because you're saying if i just need to focus on one thing then i and i will so for instance my liverpool flag that i i'm telling my brain to look at right now but then I yeah. now my brain's forgot about the bird, right? So like, how how much capacity does our brain have to take on more things and and without burnout or without overloading our system, so to speak? Hard to say, but it is estimated that we take in about forty to fifty bits per second through our eyes. For example, I'm not mm. sure about how much the ears taken for, but. This is actually what my research is about at the moment is like we have a allocated energy expenditure for the day or what we can pay attention to. So I'm looking at how we make decisions in the afternoons, predominantly after you've had a long day at work. What tends to happen is people don't take proper breaks throughout the day. So they go on social media and now your brain is actually doing something else is still paying attention to that. So you're like allocating available rent available resources of, of energy wow. to something like social media for hours and hours and hours then you expect to go back to work and be able to think in the same way that you do when you're at nine o'clock this morning so mm. it's about energy allocation so it's hard to say exactly how much we can pay attention to but we definitely have a finite amount of sort of attention networks mm. throughout the day so we call it vigilance decrement throughout the day you become more or, or less and less a, able to pay attention to something mm. i don't know if you have like trained your dog and then you see that like after 10 minutes they're kind of like losing focus they're a little bit erratic sure. they're like all over the place that's kind of what it's like for us except that we then think that actually social media is a great way to take a recovery and it's not it's like the worst thing <laughs> that you could be doing so we're now it's like shifting yeah but we all are right me as well so mm. You know, just because I'm talking about this stuff doesn't mean I'm a saint. So it's just being aware where we're allocating this energy resource mm. that we have, this attention that we have. So if you come home, you've, you know, expended a lot of your energy and then you're still trying to incorporate a brand new habit that is really, really hard. Like, I don't know, going for a run or cooking, mm. your brain is like, mm, I'm tired now. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to revert back to what is automatic and what is automatic is not doing any of those things. So I remember you telling me about this research when we when we would sit down and have a coffee and I rem and I might butcher this but I remember you in your research kind of equating it to our sleep schedules where if you look at your sleep it's not a, like a linear thing right there's times where you're in like super deep sleep times when you're kind of up time, and all these yeah. things and that's almost the same as your day like there's times when you can have super energy focused you know moments and then there's times where like you need to reset like you said Recover. and then go again and i always knew you know as an athlete and, and when you said it it clicked for me because if you think like from a football perspective 
you can't sprint for 90 minutes, but I can give you a burst of like a five second, 10 second sprint. And then I can kind of recover and go again. But it's physically impossible to sprint at maximum capacity. And it's the same yeah. in our everyday life. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about how that, you know, what you think in regards to like that sleep and, you know, our day to day tasks is like. It's interesting you said that because the way that I explain it is like if you're walking or running on a treadmill all day long for eight hours which is what you're doing at work but then not taking a recovery and then going home and expecting to do kind of like similar activity when you're there mm -hmm. that's kind of like how your mental capacity works as an, uh, an analogy so anecdotally sure. this is not research <laughs> so yeah so what was the question i don't know yeah. No, the question was. <laughs> the question was, what is the, oh the Australian rhythms? Yeah, yes, I remember. Yeah, yeah. So we we we. I think the, we're hitting our a lot capacity of... of of focus. I think we're, <laughs> yeah. meeting, we're getting to that level, so we're gonna have to course direct in a second. But answer this, and we'll, we'll make a switch. Yeah. To be fair, I I very seldom do podcasts in the evening for this exact reason, because I start losing focus. Like my brain just anyway. <laughs> I, I'm at like a five thirty six a.m. kind of girl. But anyway, so we we have these old trading rhythms now. The research on this is loose. It's quite hard to, 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 to gauge because we're not entirely sure. You know, you can't, you can't track someone's brain activity all day long. It's quite a sort of difficult way to get research. But hormonally and brainwave activity shows that we do have an, an, a pattern of movement that kind of oscillates throughout the day. We call that an ultradian rhythm. So it's the rhythm within a circadian rhythm um, of the day. So... Okay you can't expect to constantly be like there all the time. It's kind of like you do need to recover and then you have another sort of peak, if you will, and then a, a period of recovery as well. Now, mm. it has been proposed that those peaks and troughs are 90 minutes. So that sort of one cycle is 90 minutes. Mm. Again, the data on it is, is a bit loose. This is still quite new research, but it shows that we have a maximum capacity for how much we can pay attention to in one sitting, for example, and that is proposed to be around 90 minutes if you're somebody that's conditioned to be able to work that long for 90 minutes. Now, most people can't hold concentration for longer than like five, 10 minutes. We have something that is coming up in you know more recent years, and that is self-interruption. So it's your ability to interrupt yourself as you're working. So I don't know if you ever had it, you're like on your computer, you're like about to write an email or something and you're like, ah, let me just check Instagram real quick. You're like, oh, actually I need a coffee right now. Yeah, <laughs> like actually I need a coffee first and then I'll do it. So that mm -hmm. self-interruption is because your brain wants a reward mm -hmm. and it knows it can get it from coffee, from you know your mobile phone. So the best thing to do is to say, okay, actually, I really need to write down whatever I need to write down. So I'm going to check my phone in five minutes. And what tends to happen is by the time it's been five minutes, because the dopamine has been removed from it, also the, the reward aspect has been removed, you're most less likely to want to check your Instagram anyway. Mm. So self-interruption is a big, big, big thing right now. It's one of the things I talk about a lot. Yeah, and really? so true. And you know what? I, to be honest, I, and it's almost like I know that I'm doing it. But like I'll, I'll even be on a call, and I'll be like, "All right, let me like I'm I'm not interested in this call anymore. Let me check my Instagram, or let me like text somebody back." And like, and I do it, and I feel I I know immediately like it's not the right thing to do. One because it's kind of rude, and two, it's, it, it, it's 100 percent rude. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me not to have a call with you. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just, you know, like I'm, I'm spread thin. I feel mm -hmm. terrible. You know, it doesn't feel good either way. Yeah, but I, I, I totally can see how that that comes. One thing I do see on your on your social media is, and, and what I love because I love this because cool down conversations follows a similar path. Similar path. Like mm. The the media posts that I'm posting aren't filled with amazing graphics or b-roll and all these things to capture your attention quick like everybody i spoke with about social media is like you got to get their attention because you only have five seconds blah 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 and yes. what i love that you do is all of your text is in capital letters i get a lot of shit you for that said that yeah you get a lot of shit <laughs> but you said i'm, I'm intentionally doing that because yeah. it makes you slow down and read yes yeah. 
and yeah. you don't care about you know the the optics more or less but you care about you know actually reaching people helping them sit for a second and read things yeah through. yeah talk us a little bit through that yeah it's something that i actually remember someone commenting quite sort of not i wouldn't say rude is not the correct word but as soon as i explained that he was like that actually makes a lot of sense and kudos to you like one one user i me. I get a lot of people who have like dyslexia that also sort of are a bit upset with me about the way that I, I guess, present the Instagram. Mm -hmm. But then I also have other people that when I explain it, they're like, okay, actually it makes a lot of sense. And regardless of dyslexia or not, like if you slow down, you, you can read it. It just takes a lot more effort, which is exactly mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do. We don't put in a lot of effort into a lot of things nowadays. Like Instagram is mm -hmm. so easy. Like you're gaining free information and then still complaining about the way that it's presented because it's not easy <laughs> enough for you. Do you know, like the irony in that. So <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's hard to read full caps. I know because sometimes I have to read them back and I'm like, I should really make this in like normal <laughs> sentence case. But then I'm like, no, that's the whole point point is just slow down for five seconds you literally have five to ten maximum i hardly ever write ten slides of information mm. five to seven maybe eight maximum ten slides of free information that you can just digest for a second you know so it's like yeah it's it's an interesting one i'm glad we're talking about it because i want people to know i, I kind of wanted to put out a post where i tell people like this is why i make caps because i want you to slow down <laughs> <laughs> slow down that like let the slow dust down. settle we're so quick to to move on to the next thing and like yeah, you said exactly everything i mean yeah we don't have that if there isn't that buffer and i've noticed it too in, in calls and and doing you know anything in life you don't have that buffer between what you just did to what you want to do next it the next thing we do is half-assed right and and we're yeah. you know not fulfilled and by the end of the day we're you know as they say in liverpool cream crackers like we're knackered right and we're <laughs> And but so I understand that, and I love the fact that you're also forcing people, and, and you've be, you've created enough influence too, where people go, all right, dang, Nicole knows what she's talking about. Let me actually do this. And I've I've learned so much just from reading your stuff, talking with you, and Thank you know you. I want I want to <laughs> wrap these these calls up. Yeah, that's up there with like singing birthday, happy birthday. It's like oh, thank. Like how do we take compliments? <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm actually I'm getting bad at that because I'm like. What well, there's a couple of things I'm working on. It's taking compliments, sitting in that silence. You know when you say something and then there's like mm. a gap and you're like, feel the need to fill it. And I'm just like, silence, waiting for you to respond because it's so easy to be like, ah, blah, blah, blah. and then like money conversations where I'm like, this is my fee. Mm. Fuck. Yeah, That's, those are it's my three things that I'm working like on right two now. Two people that are two people that are coaches and like they understand like you know the deal is kind of done in the silence and you yeah know, it's like me and you get on a call and, and we're, we're we're both working on sitting in that silence and then we end up just not saying anything because <laughs> we don't want to yeah. speak first that's usually what happens but that that's great so it, other three things if if listeners were to come here and you know they're either followers of you already or or they've come to your page now and I'm sure you get this and I'm sure there's so many, but if you could give us like two to three low hanging fruit takeaways of how people can get plugged into creating life giving habits starting now, what is it that we can do? And you know, that ease, ease of entry, like anybody can start now. Like what, what would you say? I mean, it's a low hanging fruit, but it's mm. a hard one to take off the tree. And that is to stop so much social media because wow. we're so quick. I don't know if you ever paid attention to how, like if you don't have your phone on you, say you left it at mm. home, how many times do you just reach into your pocket? Mm. Pay attention, try that one day. It's so automatic, you don't even realize you're doing it. And it's taken up so much brain space that you then don't have the capacity to do anything else. Mm. Now, another thing that I've found is like, when I'm super addicted to my phone, I'm super addicted to wanting to eat more because I'm like so dopaminergic that I'm like more, 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 mm. more, more all the time. And like, I can't concentrate. Like my brain's kind of like, I've got to write something and I'm like self-interrupting because I want to grab my phone. So it's a low hanging fruit because it's free. You know, it's like, it's accessible to pretty much everyone, mm. but it is a really hard one to pull off, I would say, because 
it's it's a big thing and I think when you don't use social media as much and you like try and work on limiting it you'll see how much more capacity you have for other things that's Kobe mm-hmm. just throwing himself down on the ground just in case you heard that he has this thing where he just like throws himself down <laughs> so if you've heard a loud bang that's him <laughs> so that's one mm-hmm. two I would say like in terms of habits you have to tell yourself every day that that's something you want to do because most people say they want to do something and then by Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they've for- either not done it or forgotten that they even said they wanted to do it. And they're like, I said I was going to do the running thing like last week and I didn't even do it once because the brain is going to revert to automatic. If you don't do that, it's going to take the most energy efficient route and that is to not run. If you don't wake up and run in the morning and it's not a habit, the brains are not going to be like, hey, guys, we need to run, remember? It's going to be like, nah, we've got other things to do. <laughs> the brain doesn't speak like that, but <laughs> if it did, that's what it would sound like. So you have to tell yourself every day, kind of like have a practice. Maybe, you know, you want to take supplements, put them next to the coffee. If you want to go for a run, put your stuff out the night before. Make sure you're prepped so that when you wake up in the morning, the the sequence of events is different. You now have clothes that are ready. You maybe put your phone there instead of next to you so that you have to get up. Mm. And then getting up reminds you, actually, I put it there because I had to be reminded to go for a run. And actually, I can see that my clothes are there. So actually, let's go for this run, mm. you know? So intention and attention has to be that it's, it's hard. It's like the thing you have to like push through. It's like taking the path that's less beaten, even though there's one that's really nicely paved there. And you're like, I really want to go down that route. But you have to go down that one until that one's got its own paving. Got and then third one, you know what? This is the lowest hanging fruit. Hydrate, hydrate more. Hydrate, wow. hydrate well, hydrate consistently because our brain literally communicates in the space of water in the presence of sodium and potassium so even a two percent reduction in or water intake or dehydration if you will can impact our psychomotor activity so how we react to things how we make decisions our brain processing speed so just hydrating correctly and efficiently and what i mean by that is like even just regularly I've got a, literally a bottle of, you know, electrolytes here. You don't necessarily have to have electrolytes. I'm not one of those people that's like, go and buy all these supplements. Just water. Just drink it. Drink it more regularly. Don't don't be that guy that comes home at 6, a, 6 o'clock in the evening. It's like, okay, here's my first glass of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs> drink regularly. And it's the lowest hanging fruit I can give you. Awesome. That's fantastic. So thank you for giving us these takeaways. Now I want to put this back onto you and ask you what you are excited for in your personal life. I know you're in Portugal now. I'm kind of answering for you in from a business perspective. What's exciting you moving forward? So I feel like I'm in this era, like cocoon era, era of my life where mm. Everything the last few years have just been crazy. Like I've been studying while starting a business, whilst doing my masters, while doing research, while doing this. While it's just mm-hmm. been wild. And like I, I got to the point where I was like, I would wake up some days and I would feel like I'm gonna have a heart attack because that's how stressed I was. Yeah, no, it was wild. So now I'm just in this area of like peace cocoon i'm creating. I'm making time for me. I'm only taking on jobs and clients that are like. You know, I don't want to be like some people are not worth it, but they're mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, things that are more worth my while. I'm actually not taking on any clients at the moment. I'm taking on consulting clients, but not coaching clients. So only things that kind of like serve me right now that are kind of like worth my time because I need to just reset, rebuild. I'm even I'm not even putting out as much content as I was last year. I'm not focused on growing anything. I'm just kind of mm-hmm. like I just need to like I'm excited about just helping me and like making my home life just super comfortable and like you know we're trying to buy a farm we're trying to buy land we're trying to just live a very peaceful life and just cut down on all the extras and and create a nice life for ourselves I think that's what I'm excited about right now is just going in so that I can then recharge and put back out when the book is ready I'm like now ready to do talks again I'm ready to you know go on a book tour I'm ready to collaborate I'm ready to do this I'm ready to go on loads of podcasts like I'm not I've barely said yes to any podcast this year, mm. only a couple. So, yeah, <laughs> you're a good friend. So. <laughs> I was going to say thank you for finding this valuable where you were able to say yes, because as you were saying there, like I'm not telling, I'm not answering emails, I'm not talking to anybody, but mm. Nicole, 
the fact that you you know gave us your time based on you know the cocoon phase that you're in and all the work that you're doing i know so much is going into it and this writing of a book is never easy so i want to thank you so much for being so open and vulnerable with us and and giving us some fantastic golden nuggets that we can share thank not you only with ourselves but multiple people how do we stay in touch with you where do we we look for the new book give us some info just my instagram nicole's neuroscience it's the only place that i have social media i use excuse me linkedin a little bit but instagram's fine you can also sign up to my mailing list on my website, which is nicolesneuroscience.com. I don't send out any emails, but I will <laughs> when I'm out of my cocoon phase. <laughs> awesome. So we'll add all those into the show notes. And thank Nicole, you. thank you again. Please give love to Kobe. I know you have a new pup now. Is it Max? Yeah, Maxine. She's wild. Oh, Maxine. We got her thinking that it would be a way to keep Kobe busy, but actually she keeps us more busy. <laughs> She's sweet though. That's She's awesome. really sweet. So yeah. we wish you the best of luck with everything and thank um, you. can't wait to link up in Portugal soon because I think yes. that's the move. You are welcome. Europe.